So improvisation is a bit like life. You learn some rules and you learn the basics, but then you learn all these other wonderful things about how to, how to make new things. So I love that. I like that a lot and that's what keeps me going. I think there's some gifts and talents that we're just born with and some that are developed through discipline. And in our lives, if we're fortunate, we have anchoring and this ground base familiarity, something that plays out there with some consistency. John Shelby Spawn called it the ground of all being. Some would say God, some say my higher power. I like to say we are Judeo-Christians and uh, then we take it from there and run with it in what we make of our own lives. My full name is Mary Elizabeth McKechnie Wilson. I was born at the Women's College Hospital in Toronto in a snowstorm on March 16, 1948. My father was from Scotland, Glasgow, a Glaswegian, Charles Campbell McKechnie. My mother was christened Evelyn May Good, G-O-O-D. She was born in Berlin, Berlin, Ontario, that is, uh, before Berlin was renamed after the Second World War and called Kitchener, Kitchener, Ontario. I had a very solid childhood. Some might even say it was boring. And psychotherapists say boring can be extremely good. You know what's going to happen basically each day. It's secure and loving. You go for rides in the car, you bring along a few friends from the neighborhood. Might be our old Plymouth 1953, the Maroon Plymouth. My mother loved to what she called run out to Young Street for her daily shopping. So there were lots of little trips, both walking or driving. And my father would have loved to be a philosopher or a university professor. He was a reader. However, he was from a business oriented family and he went into business financial work in Glasgow and then in London, England, and then in New York. I could look out my window when I was very young and on the south side I could see right into a school grounds and that is Blythewood School and it's still there. I was at that school for eight years and then I went to a school I could still walk to, St. Clement's School. Wonderful crest, the cross is my anchor. Uh, still a motto in my life. And then I went on, many choices, but I got into Victoria College and went to U of T. Perhaps the biggest first decision I made was uh, I was looking at a notice board and I saw there's a job in Pakistan. Hmm, interesting. There's another job in Venezuela. Hmm, very interesting. Maybe I'll apply for one of those. Maybe I won't even tell anybody. I did get that job in Rubio, Venezuela. I have a brother who is eight years older. His name is Peter, Peter Struthers McKechnie. He lives in a beautiful part of the world near St. George in Ivins, Utah. I remember a time I was in a little cabin right down on Lake Muskoka. And my brother and his wife, Lynn, were coming over on a jet ski from a place they were staying. I could get out a whole big piece of full scap and magic markers. I was putting down favorites, priorities. <laughs> At high school I went to was so goal-driven, goal-oriented. You got yourself organized, you always tried to have goals, so I was doing that. I was at an in-between part of my life. I have a little first circle. Who are the most important people? Where's the heart of my life? Where's the anchoring center? Then I did another circle, I had the next people in that. Then I did another on the outside, a kind of a perimeter. Anyway, there was a knock. I knew my brother and his wife were arriving. I put the pens down, the magic marker colors, and they came in. The last minute I realized, I better move them quickly from the circle I've got them in into something slightly closer to the center. He caught me and he said, hey, how come we weren't closer to the middle of your relationships? We all had a really good laugh about that. Caught, gotta be careful. What would they say now? They'd say, Busted.
My next door neighbor girlfriend, Frances, gave me and others all her extra pen pals. She had many. And I then was given the name of a pen pal, Robert James Wilson, in Timaru, New Zealand, the South Island. And my mother would say that you've got letters, you should open them. And they were uh, narrative, historical, political, very detailed letters from this 11 year old. And we wrote for 10 years. Then we met, but well, here I was with somebody that literally asked me one week after I met him. And uh, I just kept laughing. What, are you serious? No, 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 seven nights in a row. And then I said, yes. I think on the eighth night, got married. Very long marriage, 30 long, 30 years. If you're gonna get as serious as getting married, you also sat down with the third party that agreed to marry you and you were asked some questions. One of those questions was, would you like to have children? We agreed on that. And we had first Carla Rosemary two years later and followed up with a companion, Benjamin James, 18, 19 months after that. We were extraordinarily happy. So there was the nuclear family and Rob's father said, you've got a pigeon pair. I never heard the expression pigeon pair again. Um, I think I probably, well, we just assumed it was something good that happened in twos. I thought about social work. I, I knew I, I just loved playing and being with kids and uh, it was going to be something that involved children. And an opportunity came in a great way to go into children's publishing. People that tell stories, they're really committed to what they believe in. And a children's story has to be perfect. Kids see through everything. It's harder sometimes to tell a good children's story than it is to write a long novel. Even though people think it's a breeze and you can do it easily. The other fascinating thing is where do you find beautiful art? Well, you look for the most talented artists. They might be in Kurdistan, they might be in Russia, Germany, Southern Hemisphere, China, India. They are, in fact. That was a great discovery. I, I, I'm a bit bothered when people look at a book and they say, oh, that's a children's book. Really? Is there such a thing? I worked for two people who said, we don't want to know about lessons in this book. You tell a story to live in it. It's a problem of teaching. You don't want to teach all the time. You want to be that guide from the side. And in life, you want to be just the guide too. But we love taking over. Aren't most of us wanting to be A-type, alpha, alpha types? And then we grow a bit and we realize, no, 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 let's, you know, let's hand over more and more responsibility to others. Good thing to do, travel light. I'm trying to do that myself. Lighter and lighter, shed, shed, shed. Especially by my decade, you know, whatever it is. If I could have dinner with one person tonight, any person dead or alive, it would be Jesus. You were there for everybody. It didn't matter about race or creed, about gender, male, female, rich, poor, where you lived in the world. I think I'm just with you. Your messages are universal, they're current. Let there be peace, let there be peace on earth. Do I understand the Trinity? Absolutely not. Do I understand how you could be man and divine? No, that's part of the mystery. And your unconditional love? Who could do that? I sure can't. Some people tell me they can't. They can love unconditionally. And maybe I envy them. Maybe I don't believe them. But that kind of love, I believe that I'm loved that way. And that I can love myself that way. If we were inviting a couple of people for dinner, Jesus, like who would we add? Maybe Naomi or Ruth. The New Testament, it'd be nice to have a doctor. We could add Luke in. Let's have Joan of Arc. What about um, Queen Elizabeth? Let's have her. Well, let's have some, a uh, couple of homeless people from nearby. It's a big table. Keep, put, keep putting extensions in. Isn't it great 
that we have second chances in our lives. I dated a young man that lived in our neighborhood, Phil Arthur, when I was about 14 or 15. He was a bit older. And then we went our separate ways and we both had long and interesting marriages and families. He said, I tried to find you, but you didn't come up on Google. And I said, yeah, well, um, now I have found you and you look quite different. But I really like the things that I read about you there. And we met again and it was so comfortable because of already having met each other's parents, brothers and sisters. He said to me, do you like to travel? And I said, oh, I've done all that. I've been on really long trips, like New Zealand, South Africa, Zimbabwe three times, Ghana, Uruguay. He said, but well, but if you could, would you still travel? <laughs> and uh, I took that as an invitation and off we went to some really wonderful things. Phil has had a wonderfully successful uh, career, uh, family life, and a gift giver, and a lavish lover and acceptor of others. I'd rarely hear Phil say an unkind word. He loves getting lost in a book. Thank God for that. Two people that love to read. Yeah. And he loves me. So how wonderful is that? There's so many beginnings and new beginnings and opportunities and second chances. And it's so easy to blow it, make a mess of things. What would I consider the biggest successes? It's a pretty, pretty difficult thing to put into words and think about. I'm gonna say, getting up every day, looking out the window, welcoming life, having a sense of thankfulness. I have today, fantastic gift. The courage to get up every day and find good things, uh, integrate things that haven't perhaps gone well with positive things that I get to choose that I can make and have go beautifully. Uh, and music sure helps. This is a remarkable whale bone sculptor. So what do you want as far as, you know, how I'm sitting in that? I'm not a, really a leg crosser myself. Stones, talismans, landmarks. 